Speaking of traveling out into deep space, yeah, you already mentioned this a little bit. Uh, you uh, made a beautiful video called The Journey to the End of the Universe. And sort of at the start of that, you're talking about Alpha Centauri. So what would it take for humans or for human-like creatures to travel out to Alpha Centauri? There's a few different ways of doing it, I suppose. Um, one is, it depends on how fast your ship is. That's always gonna be the determining factor. If we devised some interstellar propulsion system that could travel a fraction of the speed of light, then we could do it in our lifetimes, which is, I think, what people normally dream of when they think about interstellar you know, propulsion and travel, that you could literally step onto the spacecraft, maybe a few years later you step off an Alpha Centauri B, you walk around the surface and come back and visit your family. There would be, of course, a lot of relativistic time dilation as a result of that trip. You would have aged a lot less than people back on Earth by traveling close to the speed of light for some fraction of time. Um, the challenge of this, of course, is that we have no such propulsion system that can achieve this. So, but do you think it's, it's possible? Like, uh, so you, you, <laughs> uh, you have a paper called The Halo Drive, Fuel-Free Relativistic Propulsion of <clears throat> Large Masses via Recycled Boomerang Photons. So uh, do you think, uh, first of all, what is that? And, se <laughs> and second of all, uh, how difficult are alternate propulsion systems? Yeah, so the, before I took in the halo drive, there was there was an idea, because I think the halo drive is not gonna solve this problem. I'll, I'll talk about the halo drive in a moment, but the halo drive is, is useful for a civilization which is a bit more advanced than us that has spread across the stars. Mm -hmm. And it's looking for a cheap highway system to, to get across the galaxy. For that first step, because um, uh, just to context that, the, the halo drive requires a black hole. So that's why you're not gonna be able to do this on the earth right now. Um, but there are lots of black holes in the Milky Way, so that's the good news. So we'll come to that in a moment. But if you're trying to travel to Alpha Centauri without a black hole, um, then the, the most, you know, there are some ideas out there. There was a Project Daedalus and Project Icarus that were two projects that the uh, British Interplanetary Society conjured up on sort of a 20, 30 year time scale. And they asked themselves if we took existing and speculatively uh, but realistic attempts at future technology that are emerging over the next few decades, how far could we push into the uh, travel system? <clears throat> and they settled on uh, fusion drives in, in that. So if we had the ability to essentially uh, either detonate, you, you can also imagine that kind of nuclear fission uh, or nuclear fusion bombs going off behind the spacecraft and propelling it that way, or having some kind of uh, successful nuclear fusion reaction, um, which obviously we haven't really demonstrated yet as a propulsion system, then you could achieve something like 10% the speed of light in those systems. But these are huge spacecrafts. And I think you need a huge spacecraft if you're gonna take people along. Um, the conversation recently has actually switched and that's that idea is kind of seems a little bit antiquated now. And most of us have kind of given up on the idea of people physically, biologically stepping on board the spacecraft. And maybe we'll be sending something that's more like a micro probe that maybe just weighs a, a gram or two. And that's much easier to accelerate. You could push that with a laser system to very high speed, get it to maybe 20% of the speed of light. It has to survive the journey. Probably a large fraction of them won't survive the journey, but they're cheap enough that you could maybe manufacture millions of them. And some of them do arrive and are able to send back an image or maybe even uh, if you wanted to have a person there, we might have some way of doing like a telepresence or some kind of delayed telepresence or um, some kind of reconstruction of the planet which is sent back so you can digitally interact with that environment in a way which is um, not real time but representative of what that planet would be like to be on the surface. So we might be more like digital visitors to these planets. Certainly far easier practically to do that than physically forcing this wet chunk of meat to fly <laughs> light years across space to do that. Um, and so that's maybe uh, something we can imagine down the road. The halo drive, as I said, is, is thinking even further ahead. And if you did want to launch large masses, large masses could even be planet-sized things. In the case of the halo drive, you can use black holes. So this is kind of um, a trick of physics. You know, I often think of the universe is like a big computer game and you're trying to find cheat codes, hacks, exploits that mm -hmm. the universe didn't intend for you to use. But once you find them, you can 
address all sorts of interesting capabilities that you didn't previously have. Yeah. And um, the halo drive does that with black holes. So if you have two black holes, which are a very common situation, a binary black hole, um, and they're in spiraling towards each other, LIGO has detected, I think, dozens of these things, maybe even over 100 at this point. And these things, as they merge together, they uh, the pre-merger phase, they're, they're orbiting each other very, very fast, even close to the speed of light. And so Freeman Dyson, uh, before he passed away, I think in the 70s, he had this provocative paper called Gravitational Machines, and he suggested that you could use neutron stars as an interstellar propulsion system. And neutron stars are sort of the... Uh, the you know the lower mass version of a binary black hole system essentially in this case he suggested just doing gravitational slingshot just fly your spacecraft into this uh very compact and relativistic binary system and you do need neutron stars because if there were two stars they'd be physically touching each other so the neutron stars are so small like 10 kilometers across they can get really close to each other and have these very very fast orbits with respect to each other you shoot your spacecraft through, right through the middle, like flying through the eye of a needle, and you do a slingshot around one of them, and you do it around the one that's coming sort of towards you. So one of them be coming away, one of them be coming towards you at any one point. And then you could basically steal some of the kinetic energy in the slingshot. In principle, you can set up to twice the uh, speed. You can take your speed, and it becomes your speed plus twice the speed of the, black, of the neutron star in this case. And that would be your new speed after the slingshot. This seems great because it's just free energy, basically. You're not doing any, you know, you're not generating, you don't have a nuclear power reactor or anything to generate this, you're just stealing it. Um, and indeed, you could get to relativistic speeds this way. So I loved that paper, but I had a criticism. And the criticism was that this is like trying to fly your ship into a blender, right? This is <laughs> this is two neutron stars, which have huge tidal forces. Um, and they're whipping around each other once every second or even less than a second. And you're trying to fly your spaceship and do this maneuver that is pretty precarious. And so it just didn't seem practical to me to ever do this, but I loved it. And so I, I, I took that idea, and this is how science is. It's iterative. It's, it's, you take a previous great man's idea and you just sort of maybe slightly tweak it and improve it. And that's how I see the halo drive. And I just suggested, why not replace those out for black holes? which is certainly very common. And rather than flying your ship into that uh, that hellhole of a blender system, you just stand back and you fire a laser beam. Now, because black holes have such intense gravitational fields, they can bend light into complete 180s. They can actually become mirrors. So you know, the sun bends light by maybe a fraction of a degree um, through gravitational lensing, but you know, a compact object like a black hole can do a full 180. In fact, if you, obviously, if you if you went too close, if you put the laser beam too close, the black hole would just fall into it and never come back out. So you just kind of push it out, push it out, push it out until you get to a point where it's just skirting the event horizon. And then that laser beam skirts around and it comes back. Now the laser beam wants to do a gravi- I mean, it is doing a gravitational slingshot, but laser, I mean, light, photons can't speed up unlike, unlike the spaceship case. So instead of speeding up, the way they steal energy is they they increase their frequency. So they become higher energy photon packets, essentially, and they get blue shifted. So that you send maybe a red laser beam and it comes back blue, it's got more energy in it. And because um, photons carry momentum, which is somewhat unintuitive in everyday experience, but they do, that's how solar sails work. They carry momentum, they push things. Um, you can even use them as laser tweezers and things to pick things up. Um, because they push, the me- it comes back with more momentum than it left. So you get a, an acceleration force from this. And again, you're just seeing energy from the black hole to do this. So you can get up to the same speed. It's basically the same idea as Freeman Dyson, but doing it from a safer distance. And there should be of order of you know a million or so or 10 million black holes in the Milky Way galaxy. Um, some of them would be even as close as sort of 10 to 20 light years when you do the occurrence rate statistics of how close you might expect feasibly want to be. They're of course difficult to detect because they're black, and so they're inherently hard to see. But statistically, there should be plenty out there in the Milky Way. And so these objects would be natural waypoint stations. You could use them to both accelerate away mm-hmm. and to break and slow down. Oh, and uh, on top of all this, you know, there's we've been, we've been talking about astronomy and cosmology. There's been a lot of exciting uh, breakthroughs in, the, in detection and exploration of uh, black holes. So the the the, the boomerang fo- boomeranging photons that you're talking about, there's been a lot of work on 
photon rings and just all the fun stuff going on outside the black holes. Yeah. Um, so all the the garbage outside is actually might be the thing that holds a key to understanding what's going on inside. And there's the Hawking radiation. There's all kinds of fascinating stuff. Like, uh, I mean, there, there's trippy stuff about black holes that I can't even, well, most people don't understand. I mean, the holographic principle with the plate mm -hmm. and the information being stored potentially outside of the black hole. I don't even, I can't even comprehend how you can project a three dimensional object onto 2D and somehow store information where it doesn't destroy it. And if it does destroy it, uh, challenging all of physics. All, all of this is very uh, interesting, especially for kind of more practical applications of how the black hole can be used for propulsion. Yeah, I mean, it, it may be that black holes are used in all sorts of ways um, by advanced civilizations. I think, uh, Again, it's been a popular idea in science fiction or science fiction trope that Sagittarius A star, the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy, could be the best place to look for intelligent life in the universe because it is a giant uh, engine in a way. You know, a unique capability of a black hole is you can basically throw matter into it and you can get these jets that come out, the accretion disks and the jets that fly out. And so you can more or less use them to convert matter into energy V equals MC squared. And there's pretty much nothing else um, except for, you know, annihilation with, an, with its own antiparticle as a way of doing that. So they have some unique properties. You could perhaps power civilization by just throwing garbage into a black hole, right? Yeah. Just throwing asteroids in and you yeah. power your civilization with as much energy as you really would ever plausibly need. And you could also use them to accelerate away across the universe and you can even imagine using small artificial black holes as thermal generators, right? So the Hawking radiation from them kind of exponentially increases as they get smaller and smaller in size. And so um, a very small black hole, one that you could almost imagine like holding in your hand, would be a fairly significant heat source. Um, and so that raises all sorts of prospects about how you might use that in an engineering context to power your civilization as well.